After the Ontario government abruptly cut the number of councillors in the provincial capital by half, during a municipal election campaign, no less, it announced its intention to review regional governments in several parts of the province. The idea was to improve governance and service delivery to get better value for taxpayers. It was welcome news to some, not so welcome for others. And then the province said it would do nothing. Here for their thoughts, four municipal leaders introduced in order of population. Maurizio Bevilacqua is the mayor of Vaughan. Marianne Mead Ward is the mayor of Burlington. Jim Diodati is the mayor of Niagara Falls. And Graydon Smith is the mayor of Bracebridge and deputy chair of the District of Muskoka. And you definitely get the prize for having come the furthest to be here today. <laughs> should have brought my snowmobile. In a snowstorm. <laughs> Three and a half hours, eh? Three and a half it hours. It was, and it was regularly a two-hour drive, so I don't want to do it too often. We. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is his quota. <laughs> so don't invite me back, is that what you're saying? No, just invite me back in the summer. <laughs> okay, all right, gotcha. Well, okay, right now all of you represent various municipalities around the province, and you, actually, your worship on the end, um, represent a district as well, You're the district of Bracebridge. How well do you think, and let's just go around the table here, how well is the status quo working in terms of what you're able to deliver to constituents because of the governance models you all have? I think for us, which is a, a very clearly delineated two-tier system, it's working quite well. So at the town level, uh, we're doing a lot of the day-to-day -day things in terms of recreation, planning, uh, some other administrative matters at the district level, uh, housing, social services, regional road network, uh, some of the bigger issues, water and sewer. And and it's been around since 1970 for us, and I, I think we've got a handle on it. Um, so you're that, happy that the province yeah. basically said, we're not going to do anything right now? Generally, because I, I think that if there's going to be change, I'd like us to initiate the change. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Marianne Meadward, your view. We had a huge public advocacy campaign in Oakville and Burlington, uh, and the residents started this, saying, we're really happy. We have 90... 8% satisfaction on our community services. We had zero tax increases and then at the rate of inflation for those services. And it works when we're doing services that really don't respect boundaries, don't respect borders like regional roads or how the watershed works or things of that nature where you really need a, a much bigger picture. So the residents said they were happy and they also said, let us decide. We want to be the masters of our own house. Metro Chenu, I think they called it in another Absolutely. province in the country. Okay, and they want that in Burlington too. We certainly did, gotcha. and we got it. Okay, Mayor Bevilacqua. Well, let's give context to this. I think we're living in the city of Vaughan. It's a golden age. Uh, we have a, we're building a $1.8 billion hospital, uh, first smart technology hospital in the entire country. We're building a downtown core because we've invested in the subway. It's the first subway outside of the city uh, of Toronto. Uh, our unemployment rate is 4.2%, 4%, the uh, Statistics Canada will tell you it's full employment. We're growing at a rate of 4%. Since 2010, we've created over 60,000 jobs. Uh, in total, we have around 235,000 jobs, 12,000 small businesses. Uh, we just opened up a 900-acre uh, park, North Maple Regional Park, uh, 900 acres, and we're building it, not just for this generation. A hundred years from now, we want people to say that back in 2019, uh, that generation uh, understood the importance of, uh, of uh, green space. So things are working well without provincial interference, in your view? Yes, uh, absolutely, and we went for the status quo. But now I think when we talk about the status quo and people favor the status quo, there's a caveat there that change is constant in that mm -hmm. status quo, that we have to always adapt to, to, to various uh, mm -hmm. uh, circumstances. So, for example, uh, when the provincial government decided to uh, eliminate campuses, uh, the one in York University yeah. in Markham, for example, and others, Melton. I've always wanted to have a, a university in, in uh, the city of Vaughan. I think uh, the, you need an educational anchor. So a couple of things I did. Number one, I went uh, to uh, New York State and uh, attracted uh, Niagara University. Niagara University is a very interesting university because it's a binational university. It's recognized both in Canada uh, and the United States. Over 5,000 teachers that teach in our, in our system, Ontario system, are, are graduates uh, of, um, of Niagara University. So you've got an American university operating in Markham right now? No, in Vaughan. In Vaughan. That's mm -hmm. right. 
So and the, and the, the campus in Brampton was canceled, the campus in Markham in, was canceled, in Milton. Milton was canceled, yep. but, but you've got, you've that's got right. an American outfit coming. That's right. They're in, they're in already, they're in. students uh, are, have already attended classes. But the reality of this is when I talk about this uh, change being constant is that you have to know, learn how to pivot. Uh, at, at the end of the day, just because the province of Ontario is not giving you a campus, you've got to find ways to make it happen. And you also tie, and this spurs on other activities. For example, we have 82 acres of land for the hospital, uh, hospital uh, precinct. So we just signed a memorandum of understanding with Venture Lab, with uh, York University, with Mackenzie Health and the city of Vaughan to create a world-class health uh, healthcare center. The Economic Development Office in your city is going to be thrilled at the commercial you just gave. For, <laughs> yes. I'm telling you, that was good. Anyway, let me go to the mayor of Niagara Falls. The fact that the province has opted to do nothing, in your view, is what? Well, first I want to say I'm ready to move to Vaughan after that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'll say it was a little anticlimactic. Uh, we were expecting some action. We put a lot of effort into it. There were different schools of thought in Niagara. One thing most of us can agree on, we're heavily governed with a lot of politicians. In Niagara, we've got about 430,000 people and 128 elected municipal politicians. That's an awful lot considering just up the highway, Hamilton, they've got 100,000 more people and they do it with 16 people. And, and knowing that uh, GTA went from 47 to 25, there's a lot bigger areas with much higher numbers uh, with not nearly the representation that we have. You should just explain that to people because you, you, you do have two-tier government. We, we have do. Niagara Region and then you have local municipalities. How many local municipalities in Niagara? We've got 12 local municipalities and then we've got the region of Niagara. So between the 12 municipalities and the region, there's a hundred and there, there's a big number of, mm -hmm. of municipally elected politicians. And you know, and it's funny, I know some people said more politicians is, is better because it makes you closer to the people, more democratic. Yet, I've never heard anyone say to me, you know, the solution to this problem, we need more politicians. So are you disappointed that the province did not unilaterally make a decision to change the status quo in Niagara? I'm, I, I am, and I wish they had have at least come up with a plan. Even if they said to us, we're going to give you six months to come to us with a plan on reducing your numbers mm -hmm. and showing some consistency through the region. That didn't happen. It was, as I say, anticlimactic, and it was a little disappointing. Nothing came out of it. All that work, all that effort, all that debate, mm -hmm. and nothing came out of it. Let me ask you, for Burlington, you're, you're in Halton region as well. Mm -hmm. so you're Four municipalities for roughly the same number. We're just less than 600,000. How many politicians all together? Between... 24 at the region, and in Burlington, actually, the conversation is going the other way. We have a council of seven for a, about 190,000 population. We are the smallest council of any size in the country. Uh, we cut our council in half in the 90s and, and have never changed it. So now residents are saying, you know, th four people to make a decision and we've got some big decisions. When there's controversy, they want more voices around the table. When things are going well, they're, they're quite happy with the, with the, you know, majority of four. Do you think you need a larger council to handle the issues that Burlington is facing? Well, we have talked about it. We, uh, one of the very first reports that I had to write a year ago as a new mayor was assignments to boards and committees, including citizens advisory committees, local boards like the library. There were over 60 assignments for the seven of us. Can you do that? We do do it. <laughs> We're all very type A and we don't, we don't sleep Sounds much. Sounds like a handful. But it is, it is a lot to, uh, it, it's a lot to do. Yeah, for sure. So, and the public sees that as well. And they, so they've, they've been asking, uh, you know, do we need more politicians? Well, that conversation was big in the last election. Mm -hmm. It disappeared during regional review. And the focus was head down, protect what we have. Halton region was working well. We don't want to be a city of Halton. Uh, we want to keep the unique identity in Burlington, and we're, we're doing it. We're already small and efficient, so. You're the mayor of Bracebridge. How many members of council? Nine on our local council, but district is another story, so 22 plus a chair. Mm. So we are very overrepresented when you look at our total population versus the number of politicians we have. Mind you, we have a vast geographic area uh, and some very different areas throughout Muskoka that do require, I think, a, a little bit of uh, overrepresentation at the end of the day. Uh, but our council, prior to the province coming out with the concept of regional review, was already looking at shrinking the size mm -hmm. of our district government. Uh, 22 people around a table is a lot. Uh, and it's hard to, frankly, make decisions sometimes with that many voices. So the town of Bracebridge, for example, has myself and three other councillors. Uh, I think probably two of us could carry that message instead of four. Does um, 
raise some questions about workload and, and those functions at the district and committees that would need to be covered. But I, I do think we've got too many people around the table. But as I said, we, we've started that process already. Maybe this is an opportunity for us to pick that up. Well, let's sort of explore why the province did what it did. Because certainly if we were gathering here a year ago, yeah. the province was very gung-ho to unilaterally mm -hmm. impose some changes on potentially your mm -hmm. municipalities. And then, as I suggested in the intro, they stood back. Here's what the Ministry of Municipal Affairs had to say last month. Throughout this extensive review, the government heard that local communities should decide what is best for them in terms of governance, decision-making, and service delivery. After careful consideration of the feedback we heard through the course of the review, our government stands firm in its commitment to partnering with municipalities without pursuing a top-down approach. We will provide municipalities with the resources to support local decision-making. Mm -hmm. I want to know, let's start here, why do you think Premier Ford stood down on his earlier position. Well, I think, I mean, he's been facing some, some challenges uh, right across the board from the fiscal uh, position to some of the, the issues that uh, he has listened to the people and backed down on the original, but it's not the first time that this has happened. It's sort of a pattern. Uh, but it's interesting that they would say that they would support the decisions we make. So I gather that when uh, we will knock on the door uh, of the province and we need extra funding for education and extra funding for social services and well they have offered 143 for, million bucks more right to help that's you just do to you... become more efficient yes and 143 million dollars uh, relatively speaking when you're speaking about a province when you're looking at issues like affordable housing uh, and social services is is significant but it's all it's all relative right mm -hmm. so what you have to do is you have to make sure that the province uh, understands that while we we were we participated in this uh, municipal uh, governance review there are real issues that require real funding and require require attention this is in it does no no way really distract me from the agenda that mm -hmm. i have to pursue so which means that they have to give us the tools. If they're not going to uh, invest in affordable housing as much as I think they should, then they have to give us levers to facilitate it with the private sector, for let me, example. Let me ask the Mayor of Burlington, why do you think Premier Ford stood down? His polling numbers were worse than Kathleen Wynne heading into uh, the election that she, the party was decimated, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a political reality. I also think that, um, you know, they were gonna, they were gonna upset people if they made changes. And while it's very welcome, very, very welcome to hear the message from the Premier and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing saying that they want to work with municipalities, we could have told them from the get-go that Halton is fine. Hearing the two of you talk about the opportunities in your regions, maybe focus on the ones that were looking for some change. That is a true partnership. That is working with municipalities. And we still have a lot of work to do on that. So put us through the ringer, spend a lot of hours and time and money for municipalities and citizens groups. They had lawn sign campaigns. They had letter writing campaigns. You think of all of that effort focused to nothing? at the end of the day, we, we could have avoided that conversation and started to have conversations around planning issues. I'd like the province to give us total control of planning, get rid of the local planning appeal tribunal. That costs taxpayers money and time. It is an outdated and inefficient body. Have that, you made that case to them? <coughs> absolutely. And what was their reaction? No. <laughs> so, Period, that was off? before the regional review language around oh. wanting to partner with municipalities. But Halton Region unanimously passed a motion in, the, uh, in June to ask the province to get rid of this body. We spend millions and millions of dollars defending plans that have already been approved by the province. Mm -hmm. And so that's one area that they could actually get out of our business, save efficiencies, save time, save money. There are developments that were... Uh, that are held up at the tribunal because they can't get a hearing, and council's already approved them. Hmm. It'll be a year before they get a shovel in the ground. That is delaying housing, the very thing that this thing is supposed to solve. Let me get His Worship from Niagara Falls on this. Uh, if we were having this conversation a year and a half ago, there was no, <clears throat> not quite a year and a half ago, there was no question that the Premier was going to cut Toronto City Council in half, and he was prepared to override court decisions using the notwithstanding clause of the Constitution to make it happen. He's certainly not taken that approach to this. Why do you think not? 
Well, I, I'd have to agree uh, with the mayor of Burlington that he's let his foot off the gas. He's had a lot of challenges, and you don't want to have a conflict on all fronts. You have to choose your battles and focus on where you want to put your efforts. And I think he had issues with autism groups, and you know, there's mm -hmm. there's teachers now, and there's union issues. So he's dealing with a lot of things, and uh, and I think he realized this wasn't a priority. And how did the people feel about it? We were definitely divided. We, I think some people say things were good, but a lot of people don't like change. And sometimes good is the enemy of great because you become complacent. You never get to that place of greatness and, and a real honest internal review. And for us, it's not a matter of saving money by eliminating politicians. It's a matter of too many cooks in the kitchen. And you know that old saying that a camel is just a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> and we're designing a lot of horses, you know. And, and on the other matter, um, you know, and I see two schools of thought uh, at having the LPAT or the OMB. Uh, on one hand, I agree, it can slow things down, and that's very frustrating. On the other hand, sometimes at a local level, we make political decisions. And sometimes these boards make planning decisions based on good planning principles, as they should. So sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of a, a backup for someone that maybe unjustly were, were judged politically and uh, the flavor of the day or maybe an organized campaign for or against something. Sometimes it gives you that sober second thought opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I, I see both, but I'd say overall, uh, the premier started off by calling Niagara laughable with its number of politicians, 126. And you don't disagree with them on that? I, at all. I think so why didn't he just do Niagara and he would have had your support and go in for the, for well, the political win? I think it, he did an all or, all or none, all or none uh, mm -hmm. option and he decided to leave all the regions alone and do nothing. And so here we are, we're all kind of stunned. So I've had a lot of uh, other mayors and, and elected officials and business people come to me and say, well, now what? And I said, well, I think I'm hoping that we can still go to this with a partial victory because I think there's an opportunity still. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm -hmm. as they say, but I think there's still an opportunity to re reduce our numbers because we are so overly represented. 126, and we have less politicians or less people than Hamilton by 100,000. They do it with 16. We have 126. Toronto is 10 times bigger, and they've got 25, and we have 126. We have a lot of people representing. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, I'll get the, uh, the mayor of Bracebridge in on this one. I do remember the days when Toronto had two-tier governance. Mm -hmm. And one level of government was responsible for this road, but not that road. And the lower level of government was responsible for that road, but not that road. And it was complicated. I mean, you know, you could figure it out, but it was kind of a little nonsensical at a certain point. Is there much overlap of services in jurisdictions that have two-tier governance? I think it depends on the area. In our area, for example, to use the roads example, uh, we do have District of Muskoka roads and we've got town roads. Um, typically what you see are the town crews out looking after those roads, so we're trying to do things in a logical way. So when it snows, like it has recently, uh, we're not sending out uh, one plow driving over the plowed road of someone else to get you know, to their road. And does this uh, all work? It all works? There's no confusion there? Generally speaking. Generally. You know, I always have that caveat of generally speaking. Mm -hmm. There's always things that we can work on. Um, but there are you know, broad regional things that used to be at the local level, such as water and sewer, uh, and even housing, that uh, we've really tried to move up to the district level because it needs that overarching style of governance. Uh, in, for example, in Muskoka, there are 14 water and sewer plants because of the vast geography that we serve. And some of them serve very few customers. All those plants cost tens and tens of millions of dollars to build and then operate. Uh, so we need some uh, approach where we can get a little bit of consistency uh, and efficiency in the system for these, you know, these big, broad projects that go on. Uh, and the district is good at that. The towns are good at keeping their local areas uh, you know, in the way that their residents are asking for. We've got a lovely collection of small towns. We've got some townships uh, that, uh, you know, circle the lakes in Muskoka. Um, and we're, we're still a small place, but we're growing. Um, I think it does behoove us to look at how those services are delivered and have this conversation from time to time. Uh, planning is certainly an area where I think most people do see some level of uh, duplication or overlap. Uh, and I think that's another area we can look at on our own. Uh, and maybe the money that the government has put out there for efficiencies is going to allow us to do that internally. Let's do a case study of Burlington here. Mm -hmm. You've got Halton Region making some decisions. You've got mm -hmm. the city of Burlington making other decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, in the, uh, from the issue of whether or not there's an overlap in services, is it abundantly clear to everybody who lives in Burlington what Halton's responsible for and what Burlington's responsible for? 
People don't know what the federal and provincial government does, let alone, <laughs> let alone two let levels alone of municipal. Two, two levels yeah. of municipal. Okay. So, you know, I get the calls about garbage pickup. In, in our region, that's Halton region. Uh, so we occasionally get calls about roads. Um, most of the roads that connect a large area, so our highways, Dundas, those kinds of roads that, that connect across municipalities are regional roads. And so we've been having conversations around putting up uh, red light cameras or speed radar, and then we have to figure out whose road it is. But increasingly, Burlington has assumed those roads, uh, especially if they're purely serving local traffic, and then we have to assume the cost for that. So you With, said garbage is, is regional. Garbage is regional. Police? police is regional. How about fire? Paramedic is regional. Fire is local. Fire is local. Why? Fire is local. Does that, um, why is that? That's just the way it's been done. And there's there's some, you know, the conversation that's happening is whether fire and par paramedics should be joined. That's a much bigger conversation that uh, that I think people are, are wanting to have. We just approved putting EpiPens on fire trucks in hmm. Burlington. So I think that's where that conversation's going. But uh, the biggest opportunity, I think, for shared services is around transit. So mm -hmm. in Burlington, we have people who, because they're doctors, may uh, have privileges at Oakville, Trafalgar. Uh, they might live in Northeast Burlington. It's much easier for them to get there. If they're a paratransit or a, or a transit rider, they have to take two trips. There's lag time in between, and everybody knows that time and efficiency is what, what determines whether people will use public transit. It's not mm -hmm. so much the cost. So uh, I've been pushing with my Halton uh, fellow mayors and councillors that we need to have a conversation around regionalizing transit. Are they open to that? Some are. Milton, Milton is very much open to that because a lot of their, uh, they don't have trains up to Milton and same with Halton Hills. And so they take the buses down to the GO train system. Well, they have to cross boundaries and then it becomes, for their riders, it becomes complicated and, and often involves a, a transfer. So we have to think about what our residents need first. Mm -hmm. Stephen, going back to what you were saying about residents, residents are really the litmus test of governance. Mm -hmm. If... Uh, you're getting 97% approval rating from uh, citizen surveys, you know you're doing well. Mm -hmm. You know, they're happy about the university, they're happy about the hospital, they're happy about uh, the downtown core being built, they're happy about the fact that they live in the safest community in, in Canada. Uh, these are these are signals that they, they give back to us. And, and so I think that the while the efficiency debate is very important, what, what is very, very important is are, happy, are people happy with mm -hmm. the manner in which you are governing? And, and so this is where I take my cue. You know, when so you, if they're happy, leave it alone. Well, when, when, well, they're usually happy about good things, right? And, <laughs> and so you know, when, when we're extending the, the young subway, uh, when we, uh, we have this subway yeah, now in, uh, in, in Vaughan as well, uh, those are, uh, they take pride in that type of citizenship. And, and they also view it as, as the municipal government responding to their needs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that to me is fundamental. I mean, we can have a lot of discussions about governance and who's in charge of what, but at the end of the day, uh, when you're knocking on doors, when you're at a cafe and people come up to you and say, look, we're really happy about the rapid way on Highway 7 and we're really happy about the, the park that you're opening up and, and our standard of living and quality of life, that to me is, is fundamental. Okay, let me play smart aleck here for a second then, okay? Mm -hmm. Just for argument's sake here. The, the conventional wisdom is no local politician is going to legislate his or her job out of existence and that if governance reform is ever going to happen, it, it kind of has to be led by the provincial government mm -hmm. because... Because, uh, for, for the very thing I just said, that's how we got regional government in the first place, right? Bill Davis didn't make any friends when, 45 years ago, he created all these regions. Uh, but in fact, it, it turned out it has stood the test of time, I guess I would say. Four and a half decades later, these regional governments still exist. Is it reasonable to assume, your worship from Niagara Falls, is it reasonable to assume mm -hmm. that no local politician is going to make any uh, headway on this because no one's going to legislate themselves out of existence, and you need the province to make this happen. Yes. And if you look at Toronto, Ottawa, Hamilton, London, it was always top down. I mean, occasionally you will get a little bit of that introspective approach. In Niagara Falls, about 20 years ago, we went from 12 councillors down to eight. That's rare. You rarely see that. Typically, you have uh, municipalities coming forward wanting more representation. Mm -hmm. Now, I get it when you've got a vastly growing uh, area and the workload increases. And then I think, but the focus is, I think, and, and I think the idea is that you have to have an idea of how many politicians per 
population. Mm -hmm. So you know there's a bit of a formula, there's a bit of a framework to look at. Ours seems, we're all over the board, every of the 12 municipalities have an absolutely different. Some are ward, some are at large, some have two per ward, some have one per, we're all over. Uh, the only thing consistent is inconsistency. And it'd be nice if we had a system that everybody could understand and follow. And the other thing, as I say, is we're just so overrepresented. We have so many politicians. We're the other extreme. And, and as I said before, I've never heard anybody come to me and say, if only we had more politicians, we could fix this. Because if there was that person, I'd want to meet them and pet their, their unicorn. Come, come to Burlington. <laughs> they, that was a huge election issue. And, and just I'll challenge your premise. Burlington did, as a council, cut themselves in half. They did that in the 1990s, and, and there was a lot of good reasons for it. They, they just felt they wanted, uh, there was duplication of services. They had two uh, ward councillors uh, per ward. One was just city business, the other was city and region business, and they, they did away with the second ward councillor. They just felt there was a lot of overlap, and they did that themselves. Nobody imposed that. That is rare, though, you would acknowledge. It is rare, it's rare. but but it's yeah. not impossible, and and that was also coming from the public. They wanted counselors that were more able to do it on a full time basis, and not have other jobs that p presented potentially conflict of interest took up their time. And so, by consolidating positions, cutting it in half, not only do we save money, but it allows uh, most of our council members to do it pretty much full time, so that we can, you know, sit on between us 60, 60 <laughs> plus boards and committees. So. You know, I've, and then at the region we went the other way, but we had a formula. I, we added two council members a year ago. We reviewed the whole system. Burlington get, didn't uh, get another one. We should have, uh, but there were two additional from Milton because it's growing so quickly. And I think people recognize that that's the basis on which it has to be: is what do the citizens need? What are they asking for? And if your citizens are saying, you know, cut down the size of council, or your citizens are, that's the direction you should go. Don't you? I mean, the province can give you political cover as well for doing that. If you want actually fewer politicians or if you want a change in governance, you can just blame it on the big bad province and say it's all their fault and, and actually get what you want at the end of the day, can't you? I think you can, certainly in this environment uh, in the last uh, 12 months or 18 months where we've got a government that's clearly looking for efficiencies and, mm -hmm. and asking municipalities to be more efficient and, or providing audit funds or now um, you know modernization funds. Um, but you know, there are some horses that will lead themselves to the water. And I think in Muskoka, we had started to do that. We had uh, a committee that was looking at reducing the size of council mm. in Muskoka because we had this, you know, very large number at 22. And it's not the money because there are, again, part-time councillors. Uh, the money involved is very small, but it is uh, a matter of what creates good decision making, what is appropriate governance, uh, and, and how can we best operate, you know, this fairly large entity. And so we were, I'd say, about three quarters of the way there, and then the province came along and said, we want to do a regional review. So we said, okay, we're going to stop everything because we don't want to, uh, you know, change the, the seating chart and then have it changed again for us. Um, so, you know, to answer your question again, yes, I think the government can provide cover, but I think there are some groups out there that, that want to find some change on their own. I think we should pick up that process and resume it. The struggle we have in Muskoka is because everybody deserves representation, as we all know, how do you represent seasonal residents? Well, uh, I was just going to say, it's even tougher for you because I, uh, what's your population most of the year? 60,000 throughout Muskoka. And how about in the summer? We don't know. And that is one of the <laughs> fundamental <laughs> questions yeah. that we need to answer. Um, but first you have to decide what a seasonal resident is. Is it the owner and the spouse of the property? Is it their kids? Is it their grandmother, is it the family dog? Uh, probably not that far, but there is quite a bit of conversation around what constitutes a seasonal resident. We want to make sure we get that definition right, and we want to make sure they have representation and a voice around our table, but what we do need to do is an accurate census-type um, enumeration of just how many people are in our area, where they're located, and maybe look at some seat distribution based on that. I mean, it's possible your population could go up tenfold over the summer, isn't it? So we've done a, uh, what's called a second home study in Muskoka, which is more of an anecdotal questionnaire. I, some people would call it a survey. I don't think I would take it that far. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like our seasonal population is about 80 to 90,000 people based on that. So there could be some accuracy to that, or it could be wildly inaccurate. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But you take our uh, regular population, seasonal population, and the amount of visitors that are um, 
in Muskoka at any given time, staying in hotels, motels, you know, friends' cottage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite a different place uh, for July and August for than sure. it is for the rest mm -hmm. of the time. I want to ask you, if I handed you the magic wand and I said, okay, today <clears throat> you're the mayor of Vaughan. Mm -hmm. You find yourself as part of York Region. Mm -hmm. If you were going to just change it to the way that you thought made the most sense for the most people, what would you do? Well, people re respond to results, so I wouldn't be changing very much. But like I said earlier, change is constant. Mm -hmm. You're always adapting. And uh, so it would be status quo. We have nine councillors and we have a population of over 335,000. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably mm -hmm. uh, the, the sweet spot. Of the ratio works well as it far works, as you... That's right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting how we, we, we entered this, uh, this discussion about efficiencies. Efficiencies is nothing new. As mayors, we do a lot with very little. So we Every have year. to be efficient. <laughs> and it's, there isn't really much room... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, room uh, for waste. It reminds me back in the day when I was chair of the finance committee in Ottawa and we, we had a ballooning debt. And, for those who uh, don't know, you're a former Liberal member of Parliament. That's right. And uh, we had uh, high debt, uh, escalating debt, high unemployment. Uh, uh, we had, uh, we, we, you know, the Wall Street Journal called us uh, the third world economy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with discipline, and this, this is really a message to, to the Premier, with discipline, uh, you can bring about an economic rena renaissance like we did during the, the uh, Martin and Chrétien era. Uh, you got to be focused. And uh, I know while these, these, uh, these studies on efficiencies and municipal governance are important, I think what the context of all this, the backdrop, is in fact a government mm -hmm. that is facing a, f a, f a financial crisis mm -hmm. and they need to adopt to it. Let me take the magic wand away from you and I'm going to give it to Mayor Jim. If you could wave that wand, how would you change things in Niagara Region? Well, I'd start by wanting to see the results of the two provincial facilitators. They went to all the regions, mm -hmm. uh, they received all the studies. And that was and never I, made public, was no. it? No, and I'd love to see best practices shared with all of us. So at least mm -hmm. we have something to shoot to, and then each council could know, okay, let's work toward this kind of representation. This is, this is best practices. That's what I'd like to see. There's been discussion of double direct, so you'd be a, a municipal and a regional councillor, rather than there's a delineation right now. So if you sit on city, you sit on region, they don't really connect, except for the mayors. The 12 mayors do both jobs, so they understand both, and it's much more effective, I believe, when you know what's going on in your backyard mm -hmm. and your neighbor's backyard. But tell me this, if you could, if 400,000 plus people? Yeah, 430. 430. Yeah. 430. So 430 could be a decent sized city. Would you just say, let's get rid of all the lower tier governments and create one large city of Niagara of 430,000 people, and we'll pull a number out of a hat, 31 councillors for all of that area. What do you think? Well, that was one of the models, and the other model was a four city model. And mm. both were presented to the province, and of course we went with status quo. So, so there was definitely a push for us to have some form of amalgamation mm -hmm. and efficiencies. We're already doing, and don't get me wrong, our police are regionalized. We're working right now. We're regionalizing our transit. Uh, we mm -hmm. brought the go down. We are doing a lot of things regionally. I don't want to make it look like we're dysfunctional. We're, that's not the case at all. But there's opportunity. And as I say, it's good. But uh, good is the enemy of great. We have a chance to do so much more. And I agree. And I agree with uh, my friend here, uh, Maurizio, that there's so many other opportunities. And we are. I mean, we've got a, a Ryerson's in our, uh, in our community. We've got the hospital. We've got a lot of good things going on. But this is about governance right now. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make sure. So I'd like to see that model the province gave, and come to us with just to keep the discussion alive. Let me save the last minute here for Marianne Mead Ward. If mm -hmm. you had that magic wand, you're right now Halton Region and mm -hmm. the city of Burlington within Halton. Would you change the governance in any way? We would stay that way, but we need a charter with the province. We need to be a charter city just like Toronto was trying to be, where you have you delineate what powers are exclusively yours. Planning would be the first that I would start with. I think we can regionalize transit. We have bigger issues beside government structure to deal with. We have jobs, we have economy, we have affordable housing, uh, keeping our young people employed, uh, not in precarious work. These are issues that the province could have been studying for eight or nine months, and I hope they will get back to those but in the meantime give us the powers that you have to uh to make the decisions we already know and and they agree with us now actually they agree that we uh that we know the people and we should be trusted with decision making so uh so that's our next mission is to uh to be a charter city with the uh with the province and they can do it by a simple majority vote without un upending the constitution and my last mission today is to thank all of you for coming near and far to do this program. Uh, that was Mary Ann Meadwar, who's the mayor of Burlington, and Graydon Smith, who's the mayor of Bracebridge. And also thanks to Maurizio Bevilacqua, the mayor of Vaughan, and Jim Diodati, the mayor of Niagara Falls. Good of all of you to come into TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.